Hey, who left that thing on the table? I'm pretty sure it's safe, but in any case, let's get started. About a year ago, I organized an online D&D one-shot with a party of six. The important figures here are myself, the DM, and the player, who we will call Hubert. When I briefed the group, I made it clear that it was going to be just one session, and so they didn't need to make elaborate characters. We agreed to play at a week's time, and I told them to arrive at the session with the characters made. Fast forward a week, and I'm excited to run this mining murder mystery. The party starts joining the game, and after some idle chatter, I ask if everyone is ready to play. Hubert pipes up with, Oh no, hold on, I'm just making my character. I ask if he's doing final touches. He avoids the question and says, Oh, uh, it shouldn't be too long. 30 minutes pass. He's still not done. After an hour of waiting, I realize we're not going to have enough time to do the one shot, so I make up an excuse and end the session before it even began. Due to my busy uni schedule, I wasn't able to run the one shot again for the rest of the year. I had put a lot of effort into designing it, so I was pretty disappointed I couldn't. I have no idea why Hubert didn't turn up with a character ready. I wasn't asking for a lot, just a level 3 character with minimal to no backstory. Hubert wasn't a new player either, he had played before, so he knew how to make a basic character. He was in my friend's campaign at the time too, and apparently, he was a major problem player, but that's not my story to tell. This poor DM asked for one thing, one thing just to get one one shot off the ground, and Hubert over here couldn't even do that. I would say the real demon here is scheduling, but it's not like Hubert is making it any better. Okay, so this is a story that someone demanded me to post, and I had to bury it for reasons you will see. Roll call. DM. Me? Other players. So this was a campaign that was set in a homebrew world. I had rolled up a cleric of the life domain and went full healer build with some damage, but not much. Grab the healer feat. But I did not get to do much as a cleric. After the DM reviewed my character and said, okay, we were sent off on a quest. Now, before I get too far in, I had set my god as a homebrew goddess of life and death slash wealth and poverty. So I was able to keep balance wherever I went. I saw a merchant and I haggled for a cheaper price. And when I saw a beggar, I gave him two gold. It was on our first mission that the DM decided to show how he actually felt about my character. I had just dropped a bandit wizard with a lucky hit from my mace, and the DM described, As your mace sinks into the wizard, you hear a metal tink echo from somewhere nearby. Me, I cast light. DM, you go to cast your spell with your holy symbol, but nothing happens. Me, is there an anti-magic field? I asked DM if I can see an arcane circle or an anti-magic zone. DM, no. Me? Okay, do I have line of sight on an enemy mage? You can't tell. I hid behind some rocks? I cast light. You try to cast and sparks fly from the symbol in your hand. What the hell? I inspect my holy symbol. You notice there's a crack down the middle. It nearly severs the symbol in two. Okay, so I broke my symbol mid-fight. Whatever. But after I get a new one, the very next fight, same thing. Your symbol is broken. And it's getting worse. I start only supporting the team. You're assisting in the murder of people, and your symbol breaks. Only heal the mayor of the town who opens an elderly care center? You helped a corrupt noble, and your symbol breaks. Pay the tab of some people down on their luck in the tavern? You paid for their vice, and your symbol breaks. Got materials for the blacksmith? Symbol broken. Helped the town guard? Symbol broken. Healed the rogue in the party after they went down? Broken. Gathered herbs in the forest? You just killed some plants? Symbol broken. It kept happening so much, I was healing more from herbalism than with magic. Last straw happened when Barbarian had off the first goblin of a caravan. DM, you hear an echoing tink as your symbol breaks. For the love of God, what is it this time? Standing still? You watched your teammate killed a man and didn't stop him. Okay, so can I kill, heal, or help? What can my character do without his symbol breaking? He can leave the party, DM smugly suggested. You know, that's a great idea. I turned to the other players. Sorry, folks, but looks like there's no room for a support character. And I left. TLDR. DM hates that I made a cleric and stopped me from playing, then suggests I retire the character, so I retire from the campaign. I love that this DM probably went to bed that night thinking, man, 
I really showed how much of a great DM I am. Aren't I so good at my job? I really guided that player to the right path and improved the quality of my game. No, to hell with that. Absolutely to hell with that. I don't know why this DM hated the cleric player. I mean, the cleric player seems to assume it's because of the cleric class and because he was a support character. I don't know if that is the case. Maybe that is the case. If that is the case, that's really stupid. I don't think support characters break the game nine times out of ten. They're fairly balanced. Sure, there could be overpowered clerics. You can make a very powerful support character. But just picking life domain cleric with a healer feat isn't going to break the game in half as long as you encounter build with, you know, a brain. And look, it's possible. Maybe this cleric really is breaking the game in half. Maybe the DM is really stressed when prepping encounters. I doubt it. But look, maybe that's the case. You don't solve that by being a passive aggressive dick whenever the cleric tries to do anything. You solve that by talking to the cleric about what's going on. Something this DM apparently has a problem doing. Man, that story set me off. This happened a few years ago. I was trying to introduce my girlfriend to D&D and after a few one-on-one -on -one sessions with her where I explained the rules and had her play some lighthearted fantasy shenanigans, she told me she felt ready to play in a real campaign with other people. Being the forever DM in my own group and wanting to play alongside my girlfriend, I tried to find someone willing to DM for us, but came empty handed even after months of us trying to find people that were interested. Then out of the blue, my girlfriend told me she had found out one of her uni colleagues played D&D regularly with a group of people and after some time discussing, it turned out he had always wanted to DM a big campaign and had plans to start a new group. The DM being a good guy, although really shy, something that will be important important later, tells us we can join. We were happy and started building our characters and writing some backstory ideas. We were told we would be playing in the Forgotten Realms, and he could make basically any background work with what he had in mind. Session 1 comes, we find out the exact composition of our newfound group. Introducing, myself as the Tempest Cleric, Girlfriend as the Archfey Warlock, Open Hand Monk, Blood Hunter, whose spec I don't remember, and Devotion Paladin. I will refer to them as their respective class from now on to avoid confusion. Monk is a friend of ours who got invited to the campaign, a generally chill dude and a good player, who had a lot of sessions under his belt. The juicy part starts now. Before the session starts, we chill and chat with our newfound party members and we find out that the Blood Hunter is a good friend of DMs and that Paladin is actually DMs dungeon master in their respective games. We are just now told that this game is basically a spin-off slash sequel of their own campaign and that, for shits and giggles, Blood Hunter will be playing a mixture of Geralt from The Witcher, Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, and Paladin will be playing Braum from League of Legends. This puts a bad, bad taste in my mouth, but being the first time I had the occasion to play in a long time, let alone the fact that this was my girlfriend's first time ever playing with strangers, I didn't want to ruin her excitement, so I took a deep breath and decided to see where this was going. The campaign was pretty straightforward and had a nice concept. We played a few centuries after a demon army had swept the Forgotten Realms. This army had been defeated by Blood Hunters and DM's previous characters in another session. The soul of the Demon King was then split into four parts and put in four MacGuffins, and we had the quest to retrieve them before an evil cult was able to collect them all and invoke Asmodeus once again. I'll have to summarize a full year of sparse sessions and horror events. Immediately, the paladin elects himself as leader of the group. He is often hostile and very difficult to talk to. He's also really jealous of my character, the Tempest Cleric, and gets really nervous every time I manage to outdamage him in combat. Blood Hunter is the epitome of edginess and lone wolfness. He gets very confrontational very fast and often resorts to paralyzing anyone and everything that gets in his way. This includes innocent bystanders and my girlfriend's character. Myself, Girlfriend, and Monk are treated as B-class players. Paladin and Bloodhunter are the real protagonists of the story. Paladin has 50,000 gold pieces, a plus 3 weapon, plus 3 shield, and plus 3 armor for his mount. We are level 5. Bloodhunter has a magic, although cursed, sword that sort of lets him become a demon from time to time. Bloodhunter is a prince from a faraway land, and Paladin is the king of a small nautical kingdom. Both Paladin and Bloodhunter cheat constantly. Paladin has somehow attained 20 constitution and 24 strength at 5th level, and we caught Bloodhunter using loaded dice after rolling 6 or 7 nat 20s in a row. Both admit to cheating for shits and giggles and toned it down. 
but it never stopped. Oh, this gets worse. Introducing Blade Singer. Blade Singer joins the campaign after a year. Blade Singer also played in DM's original campaign and is also a game master for another game that DM, Blade Singer, Paladin, and Blood Hunter are playing in. He comes to his first session in cosplay, cape, pointy ears, flasks, books, and all, and explains how he likes to roleplay more than anything, and that he wants to play a lawful good blade singer who is a harpist. Harpists, in the Forgotten Realms, are a good secret society who generally help people and try to maintain order and peace. Being somewhat relieved by hearing that, but very worried by his relationship with the rest of the players, we begin what would become our last session. The game starts, and Blade Singer immediately tries to kill Bloodhunter for no reason by spamming casting Toll the Dead, can't hit him because I had cast Sanctuary on the guy, gets hostile in character, and then in real life, threatening me to drop concentration on Sanctuary. I tell him the next spell I see him cast, I'll just channel Divinity Call Lightning on him. He laughs, saying he can't kill Bloodhunter in the main session, so he just wants to kill him in this spin-off. What? We drag through the rest of the game, which has us find out crazy stuff about Paladin and Bloodhunter's backgrounds. Some sort of, they are the chosen ones, powerful sons of demons, and not really humans, but constructs made in human image, yada yada yada. Myself, girlfriend, and Monk talk about the game, and conversation goes like this. So, do you want to quit? Yeah. Yup. We told Dion that this was our last session, and we quit. What bugs me the most is the fact that DM asked me for advice constantly at the end of each session, proceeding to ignore it every time since it didn't feel right towards Paladin and Bloodhunter, and he played with them in other sessions and didn't want to cause trouble. Ultimately, he was so non-confrontational about anything that went down this table. As far as I know, he still plays with Bladesinger, Paladin, and Bloodhunter, and they still sabotage his sessions just for the lols, I guess. Well, that sucks. Honestly, this is one of the most confusing horror stories just because I don't understand half of what's going on, and it feels like that's exactly the point. These people are aliens in this friend group that clearly has their in-jokes and their in-customs, and they are being incredibly exclusionary to these new players. I mean, that's not the only problem. There's plenty of other problems here. You know, you got your classic main character syndrome, a DM who's non-confrontational, yada yada yada. But that sort of alienation is something that does happen in some D&D games, where there is an in-group of people, someone new comes in, and they're not really included in the campaign. And that can feel really weird, especially when you're playing Dungeon Dragons. That's something we haven't talked about before. Another thing that's interesting here, all these events from what the OP said, they're all just things that happened sporadically over a year. And yeah, when you're reading them all in a list. It seems like god-awful, seems horrible, but in the moment, when you're just in the day-to-day -day of playing the game, you don't really notice these things until you sit back and truly think about how much fun you're having. Sometimes that kind of reflection is necessary. Don't overthink it. Don't convince yourself to get out of a D&D game just because of one bad game. But if you're starting to notice a pattern of behavior that's not going away, then yeah, it's a problem, and you should do what these people eventually did. Walk away. This player only lasted one session. He rolled up an allegedly lawful good cleric of a strict god of law and justice. During the traditional tavern meetup, Cleric is accosted by an old woman who berates him with a tirade about the corruption of the clergy, their role in propping up an unjust social order, etc. While doing this, she smacks him repeatedly with her walking cane. Owing to her advanced age, this attack does zero damage per hit. The Cleric's response is to yell, Fool hag! I curse you in the name of my god! And smacks her with his holy symbol. Everyone's jaw drops. The DM impresses on the player that a Cleric cursing someone is serious business, and that this is a feeble old woman, possibly senile or drunk and clearly no threat to anybody, but the player insists that the common rabble must learn respect for someone of my station. Okay. The DM narrates that the cleric falls to his knees, hit by an invisible force, losing half of his current hit points and all his current spell slots. An unknown but familiar voice sounds in his head. Atone! Taking the hint, the cleric goes to his room and spends the night in prayer and concentration, grumbling that he missed out on a traditional bar fight. The next morning, for reasons having nothing to do with the proceedings, the party wakes to the plot hook of half the town having been turned into monsters. The cleric is now a skeleton. After narrowly avoiding a fight against some spooked townspeople, the party decide to visit the city guard, explaining the situation as best they can and offering to help. To avoid potential misunderstandings, they decide to take the monster fight 
Hyde party member in handcuffs. The cleric does not like this idea. He spends nearly 20 minutes arguing with the rest of the party before they compromise on putting him in their collar instead, leaving his hands free. They couldn't just like leave him back at the tavern? Why did they have to bring him at all anyway? The guard's immediate response to the party walking into their guardhouse with monsters on leashes is to draw steel and demand they lie face down on the ground. Most of the party complies, but Cleric decides to be the tough guy, insisting that these peon guards will respect my spiritual authority. The guards insist again that Cleric lie down. Cleric refuses, then pulls out his mace. The DM warns Cleric that he can see these guards are tough, experienced, well-trained, armed with long swords that appear to be magical, and oh, there are seven of them. Cleric's response, bring it on. One round of combat later, Cleric has taken triple his max hit points and damage and is deader than dead. Cleric, nonplussed, boasts that his god will surely resurrect such a loyal and faithful servant as himself. DM calmly, but firmly informs Cleric that his god is a god of law and justice, and in the last day, Cleric has abused his station to bully commoners, misused his divine authority bad enough to get punished by his god personally, disrespected and picked fights with some guards, legitimate agents of the law who were just doing their jobs, gotten killed while resisting arrest by said legitimate agents of the law, and by the way, he can't expect help from the party either since they only met him yesterday. He has been nothing but trouble, and he doesn't have any treasure or magic to repay them for resurrecting him. Cleric's response? Ew. Awkward silence at the table. The cleric pipes up again. Hey, wait a minute. I'm a skeleton. They're using bladed weapons. That means I took half damage. Now, ignoring the fact that the cleric's math doesn't quite check out at the end of this story, this is definitely an example of a player character getting a little bit carried away. I don't know if it's lawful stupid or lawful stubborn, but either way, this cleric player is taking an obnoxious personality and taking it way too far. The other players at the table are probably not enjoying this show of stupidity, and the DM is clearly not enjoying it, hence the direct warning from the god of this cleric's religion. But it appears the player was unable to just take the hint, which is a talent that it seems a lot of problem players severely lack. Self-awareness is key a lot of the time. Getting carried away in your roleplay is a perfectly normal thing, but having the self-awareness to rein yourself in and make sure that you're not trampling other people or just being straight up obnoxious is pretty important. Of course, you don't want to go to the opposite side and become self-conscious. However, I don't think that's a problem that the cleric is struggling with. Obnoxious, annoying, those are the words I would use to describe this role-playing style, and it's not a role-play style that I would appreciate in my games. Hello, I'm here to tell you about this campaign that died when it was at the final few sessions. Because of shipping. We are three people in this group, myself, Layla, the other player, and Nicole, the game master. We were already 41 sessions of around 7 hours each into this campaign. For context, we previously had another campaign that died because the game master was a creep, and we had an agreement with Nicole and Layla so I could play our characters in her universe slash campaign, which had already been set up and so on and so forth. So in total, Layla and I have been playing these same characters for 70 sessions. Nicole was completely okay with this, and at first the campaign was great, but there soon started to be some red flags. For starters, before the campaign even began, Nicole really insisted that she wanted an NPC that I knew that she liked a lot and that we already knew to be kind of a Mary Sue to be childhood friends with my player character. It was a bit weird, but I agreed, didn't really think too much about it. Just to list a few of her traits of why I'm calling her a Mary Sue, she was the heir to the richest slash most powerful slash most progressive family in the world. She was an expert engineer that invented teletransportation- teletransportation? teleportation machines in medieval times out of nowhere with no magic involved. She was kind and selfless and helped orphans and everyone everywhere liked her and she was an accomplished and very popular leader. Also, she was only 20 years old. For a little bit more context, my player character has amnesia as his backstory, and this is where the red flags started showing up, with the GM constantly giving my character lots of memories with this Mary Sue NPC, even over other characters that were established to be more important to my player character. I believed at first that this was because in the previous campaign, he was very close to this established childhood friend, and I mentioned he had a crush on this other NPC, so Nicole, I guess, wanted the same. 
That's at least how it started. Then it moved on to weirder stuff, such as the Game Master trying to convince me that the Mary Sue would be my favorite when I said I liked any other NPC. She tried to keep my player character away from other NPCs by making them annoying, so the only available NPC was the one she liked. Not only that, but she kept the other NPCs away from my player character, but Nicole also made sure that my player character would not get close to the other player character in the group, Layla, with literally all NPCs constantly constantly discouraging my character from interacting with him and even talking crap about the other PC. And the NPCs that did like Layla's player character were kind of reserved for that player character only because she was very focused on getting a ship for Layla's player character too, going as far as to design a very catered character that had traits that Nicole knew that Layla liked. Of course, to keep Layla's player character away from mine. This did not work, of course, but Nicole did not care and kept on trying, pushing her Mary Sue NPC onto the group all the same, be it with the character herself or everyone telling our PCs how great she was all the time, literally every session and in every location of the world, and often reminding my player character how important she was to him and vice versa. If she was not mentioned in-game, it would be Nicole herself telling us about the Mary Sue over and over again. To give a small example, there was a point in which the PCs were just chilling on their own, hiding from the cold, and Nicole, of course, had to mention the Mary Sue to tell us she was doing the exact same thing, even though she was in another part of the world at the moment. Not only this, but she used to have a very long turns to interact with my player character and my player character alone, one of them getting up to an hour, and all of it was just very casual interactions that kept on going for no reason whatsoever, even when I tried to cut them short. Meanwhile, she was just giving Layla's player character interactions with the non-relevant NPCs that were just sort of a consolation prize, so he had something to do while the Mary Sue was on screen. These NPCs were so irrelevant that even Nicole herself forgot about them, but that was the case with pretty much every NPC, because the heroine was clearly the Mary Sue, and thus the only one that mattered. Nicole was very clear from the start about this and about the relationship she wanted for her Mary Sue with my player character, making her give him poems and gifts and stuff like that, putting my player character in a position where he could not reject her because of how Nicole chose to build my character's memories. But as I mentioned, this did not work. My character had much better chemistry with Layla's character to a point in which we shipped them from the previous campaign and Nicole did not like this, often telling me off in-game about how she disliked them together for one reason or another and tried to convince me of how her Mary Sue NPC was a much better match for my player character. Because of how concerned I was with how Nicole moved my player character's backstory to fit her ship, it would feel weird if my character did not choose the Mary Sue at the end. I mean, she was perfect after all, but I liked Layla's player character better, so I asked them both if we would have a polyamorous relationship with our characters? They both agreed, but on Nicole's side, it was kind of reluctantly when she found out it was not to be with another one of her NPCs, but Layla's PC. None of us gave it much thought, though. We just kept ignoring how Nicole kept forcing my player character to interact with her Mary Sue. It was alright, because I could ship my player character with Layla's, and it wasn't even the point of the game anyways. But then, we got to session 41, which was the session where I confirmed that my player character would be romancing both the NPC and Layla's player character, because before this, none of us had actually confirmed anything. And the session was going on alright, it was fun, but the moment our player characters started interacting a lot with each other, Nicole just went very, very quiet, and her NPCs were suddenly very aggressive towards Layla's PC. But we did not mind or even notice at the moment until the very end of the session, which was cut short, by the way, when our player characters had a semi-romantic interaction. This pissed Nicole off, making her just make us stop the interaction and saying she was tired and that she wanted to end the session. It was obvious she did not like it, and that she did not want to continue the seed that was not over next session. I should mention, by the way, that Nicole had no problem with romantic interactions per se. She made her attempts at romance with her NPC and my player character very long interactions, if you remember. She did this even when she herself was tired, so that was not the issue here. So, I asked Nicole about it the next day, because it was very weird, and her answer was even weirder. 
She first told me she wanted to end the session because the shit between my player character and Layla's made her uncomfortable, which was like, okay, fair, even if both player characters are consenting adults, but I asked her why, and she believed Layla was in some sort of competition with her to get the ship with my character, and because of this, she was thinking of putting the campaign on an indefinite hiatus. We were very close to ending the campaign at this point, so I told her that, being honest, I thought if we were going to pause it now, we should simply not come back to it. So I asked her if she had any solutions instead of this. Her solution was obviously to have more of the Mary Sue and finally integrate her into the party and telling us to keep it low with the interactions between our player characters. So basically, she wanted to have her NPC around so she could interact with my player character and keep all interactions between them and only them, basically. One of her other conditions was that we would retcon the entire session and she wanted my player character to declare love for her NPC between these sessions so they'd be a couple by this point before this semi-romantic interaction with the other player character even happened because she said her NPC would be very upset if my player character ever rejected her or dated someone else first. Of course, I did not agree to any of this, and she obviously did not like that, so she decided to kill off the whole campaign instead. I should mention that this was in a conversation between me and Nicole, and Layla did not even hear the reason why the campaign was being killed. Not from Nicole, at least. At the end, all we got was a quick rundown of what the last session would have been, with us making rolls to see how the situations would be resolved. And ever since then, Nicole has refused to talk about it, and just pretends like it never happened. I understand that shipping culture is a thing. I don't really understand it, but it certainly is a thing. I had some ships in my own D&D campaigns with my player characters shipping PCs with NPCs, NPCs with other NPCs. It happens. Alos will do that sometimes, but look, this is taking it a little bit too far. Forced romance is bad. Capital B bad. Very not good. If for some reason the romance between Layla and the OP was making the DM uncomfortable, she needs to communicate that out of game and give adequate reasons as to why. The reasons given in this post are certainly not adequate. I don't even understand what they are fully. Good on the OP though for like asking if she was uncomfortable. Asking is the first step in figuring out what is going on. It's a shame that the DM's answer was not really great, but hey, at least that first step was good. This is like the 200th Mary Sue we've seen on this channel. They're not great. They're not even fun. I really don't understand the point of playing a perfect character. There's not a lot of enjoyment there, at least for me. But yeah, overall, shame the campaign ended, but maybe it was for the best. Alright, and that is where we are going to cap off today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed it, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out our Q and Play series where I answer your questions in a rambly, unscripted format while playing some video games. And while you're there in the cards, subscribe to Crispy Starver to get more of my content right as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories and thoughts, go down into the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment, not a paladin, to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Farewell. Thank you.